Welcome to the Speaking of Purpose podcast. I'm Sona Kosla, your host and chief impact officer at Benevity. Benevity is a software company based in Calgary, Canada, and we power corporate purpose programs for some of the world's most iconic brands. This season, we chose to go deep on Indigenous topics. And while it was a short season, it led to some profound insights. This season revealed to us that the wisdom and experience we need to get through the challenging times ahead, especially as it relates to climate and justice, are within our communities. It feels bittersweet to be nearing the end of this mini-series, but I feel like it has come full circle in helping us answer the big question this podcast seeks to answer. How can people and companies operate with purpose to drive greater positive impact on the world? Today, we have an inspiring guest for you who can show us how to be an ally to Indigenous peoples. Her name is Tricia Stevens. She was one of the first people I reached out to when I started my reconciliation journey, and she gave me some practical tips, the most important being to stay humble and curious and to not be afraid. To be honest, this podcast would not have happened without Trisha. She introduced us to Lourdes Inga, who we heard from in episode three, and then Lourdes connected us with Melissa Nelson and Uruka Sumbolingi from episodes one and two. Essentially, we stumbled into a global network of women warriors and change makers who are turning the tide, not only for indigenous cultures and rights, but also for biodiversity, sustainability, and philanthropy. So let's meet Trisha and get into it. Trisha is the former Charitable Giving and Ethical Campaigns Manager at Lush Cosmetics North America, a company that's known for their luscious body butters, shower gels, bath bombs, and skincare. She's now the founder of Batch Skincare, and she joined us from her home in Vancouver, Canada. Here she is. Hi, everyone. My name is Trisha Stevens. I am on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people in what is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia. I have been living and working here for close to two and a half decades now and really enjoy being close to the energy of the Pacific Ocean. And I guess that won't come as a surprise when I share with you where I'm from, which is from the East Coast. And I grew up in New Brunswick along the Atlantic Ocean on a small peninsula just outside of the city of St. John on the traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq and Maliset First Nations. Trisha moved on from her role at Lush in October of 2021 after working there for more than two decades. Even now, it's clear that she is embedded in Lush's history and evolution. Lush's story is a great case study for companies who want to be allies and accomplices to Indigenous communities. One great example of this is Lush's Charity Pot product. So Lush, uh, being a fresh handmade cosmetics company, there's an incredible vehicle for change as it related to the products itself, as I mentioned in terms of the care and attention that was put into it from formula all the way through to the sale of the product at the end of the day and, and what the customer was taking home. And also, we believed in standing up for the rights of people, animals, and the planet and doing this through public-facing campaigns that would really uplift the voices and the narratives of organizations and help move forward whatever that cause was or issues that they were looking for, support for, or for justice related to. And then fast forward, I guess, to 2007 was really when we launched what would become our charitable giving or our largest philanthropic initiative uh, from the brand. We launched a product called Charity Pot, which was a body lotion and essentially came up with like, how are we going to utilize this as a vehicle for change? Because it's not just about what you're doing. It's really about how you're doing and what is that philosophy and what is that theory of change that you're looking to have with the what you're doing in the world. So from the very beginning, we wanted to ensure that 100% of the money was going to organizations. So not 10% or 15%. Like we wanted to be very transparent that if customers love this product and they pay for this product, we're going to 100% put the money into causes that they also care about and can learn about and then feel connected to. And on the business side, we're going to donate our time, donate our materials and the resources required to make sure that that program runs and functions as we say that it was going to. Trisha is a big champion of grassroots organizations and initiatives. 
When talking to her, you will hear her passionately share her belief that grassroots movements that start at the local level are essential for long-term systemic change. She has spent the past two decades partnering with organizations to fight for social and environmental justice and advance animal rights. During her time managing the charitable giving and ethical campaign programs at Lush, she grew the Charity Pot program to reach $56 million in grants to 3,000 initiatives in 93 countries. Lush is also a Benevity client, and in 2020, Trisha won the coveted Buffy Award at Benevity's annual Corporate Purpose Industry Conference. This award recognizes individual leadership, innovation, and impact, and is awarded to illustrious corporate purpose and social impact leaders in the Benevity client community. Trisha refers to her time at Lush and working in social impact as a lifelong journey, which is similar to the way I would look at Lush's story. All trailblazers start somewhere. It certainly has been a, a lifelong journey, but I would say has been something that I've been putting a lot of sort of time and attention to over the last, I would say, decade or so. As you, you get older, you start wanting to know more about where you come from and why things are the way they are. And so I don't know if it's just a natural transition of, of me as, as a human in the world, or also certainly just as the deep obligation and responsibility I felt around being the manager of the charitable giving and ethical campaigns program for, for Lash North America. So I guess in terms of my professional journey, it really started close to 24 years ago when I was hired at the age of 18 to work for a fast and growing cosmetics company here in Vancouver for Lush Canada. And we spent the first bit of my career really rooted in the manufacturing side of the business. So spending lots of time on the floor with um, the folks who produce all those beautiful products and really understanding where are the ingredients coming from? How are we supporting those farmer and producer communities? What was the inspiration around creating the product and, and why is it useful for folks? And really became engaged in the company's roots of being a campaigning company and standing up for what was right at a young age. From manufacturing to social impact, that's quite the journey. Having worked at Lush for 24 years, it's no wonder Trisha knows the business inside out. Now, I'm going to shift gears a bit. The Cherry Pot product we spoke of earlier was innovative at the time, and it made sense for a business that was looking for ways to create positive change in the world in an authentic way. But it can be hard to know where to start, especially if your company is new to corporate social responsibility or to working with Indigenous communities. Here's how Lush got started. So from the very beginning, we looked at what were going to be our founding kind of guidelines, who were the individuals and organizations that we wanted to partner with and support and build relationships with. And then we have this lovely vehicle, our product for change to do that. So then we have this mechanism that looks like it's set up for success, but then ultimately it comes back to how are you going to do that? Who are the people who are making the decisions? How are you getting out there and trying to find these, you know, unheard of organizations that are that are doing that work? And I would say this is where um, you start to see really like an evolution of what the North American team started doing so that we could localize giving in our market, taking it from it being a global brand concept where Lush is in 54 countries around the world. The invitation was for all countries to launch their own program, but it's like, then how do you localize that and figure out what are the most important issues with using those overlying guidelines of small grassroots, root cause, systemic change, and really and turn that into something that's going to be really powerful in your own market. It's important that companies understand themselves from the inside out, understand your industry and its impact, but also figure out what your employees care about and see where you can actually make a difference. With so many considerations, doing your research to find out where the gaps are being felt can help you create change where it's needed. And like we've mentioned in the past few episodes, be prepared to think long-term. Here's more on how Lush evolved their program to involve all of their stakeholders and deepen their impact. And so, as a grant making team, we really took an approach of looking at our grant making from sort of a holistic perspective and understanding what it means to become allies on issues. And then also the encouragement of our staff and customers getting engaged so that they can also become catalysts for change. So the charitable giving team wasn't just 
five people working on the program full time. It was the sum total of everyone in the company and all of our partners and communities that we worked in. Further to that is thinking about well, what type of funder and partner do we want to be? There's a lot of power dynamics that exist between those who have resources and those who need them. And philanthropy, again, is just another mirror of those other systems, whether it be political or financial. So we looked a lot at what was going wrong with relationships in philanthropy by listening from our grassroots partners and said, we really want to move forward with a trust-based uh, philanthropic position. And so when a lot of people hear trust-based, they think, oh, that's too risky. We could never do that. But it's like when you get down to what that is, it's really putting the um, the power and the decision making on your partners to tell you, here's what we require resources for, here's how we'd like to partner with you, here's how we're going to measure success. So you're really not taking a cookie cutter approach to what every community needs. So it takes more time to do this work and to build out these relationships. And I think often what I hear from partners who want to talk about trust based philanthropy, those are the things that come up. It's too risky or it's going to be too much time or okay now i do that and i don't have to worry about those partners at all anymore so it's just like how do you bring it back to what is the philosophy around that and for us it really came down to you know building deep and lasting relationships that were rooted in respect and reciprocity you know allowing communities to communicate their needs and what success looks like and being accessible to them basically received applications 365 days a year and processed grants on a weekly basis and would just check in with partners to see how they're doing. Like, how are you doing at a human level, not just this work that you're doing, which often is a really big weight on community leaders' shoulders. So just being an ear for folks, you know, are going through stuff and then knowing that we're here beyond that monetary donation. The keys to success here seem to be rooted in trust, relationships, reciprocity, and support. Trisha also mentioned trust-based philanthropy. It's a concept that has been gaining traction in the social impact space, especially since the onset of the global pandemic, when corporate funders started to rethink their relationship to nonprofits who were on the front lines of the crisis. It's an approach to giving that addresses inherent power imbalances that exist between funders, nonprofits, and the communities that they serve. On a very practical level, a trust-based approach advocates for multi-year unrestricted giving, meaning donations are made to nonprofits to use as they see fit. Ultimately, it's rooted in a commitment to building relationships that are based on transparency, dialogue, and empowerment of nonprofit leaders. I was curious about what Trisha could share with us about her learnings in trust-based philanthropy, given that Lush's work on this started decades ago and many corporate leaders are just starting out. I don't think we would have coined it as trust-based philanthropy lack then when we were building the program. And I think a lot of it came from the founding guidelines of our program was basically not directing and telling organizations what they should do and how they should do it. What does success look like? Like really knowing that um, in order for us to do meaningful work, we have to understand that we are not the most directly impacted and we're not the subject matter experts and we're not the people living in those communities every day coming up with those solutions. But what we can be is a partner that can support you in the work, go beyond monetary donation. And that's where really the word reciprocity comes into play for us. It's like, what can we learn from you? What can you learn from us? How do we co-create and support one another together? And there's humility in that. For us from the very beginning, we're like, what we want to do with creating this program needs to be different. It needs to be grassroots because that's who we were. And it also has to serve community. And then over time, you continue to build on what that means by the larger the base of the folks that you serve becomes. Trisha said another piece to this puzzle is ensuring you're connected with the right organizations. And sometimes the right organization isn't registered as a charity or what is called a 501c3 in the US. And so having a deep belief in really supporting grassroots organizations, like those that are on the front lines and that are directly impacted are generally the ones that are also often overlooked by other funders. 
because they seem risky. You're not a registered organization. I can't get a tax receipt. And so often you find lots of struggle happening for these small grassroots organizations, community level organizations, and often have a lot of barriers around becoming registered, or in some cases don't want to become registered charities or 501c3s because they do a lot of political advocacy. So their programming and activities isn't a fit for what the federal governments in North America has deemed worthy of having a charitable or a 501c3 status. This season is all about Indigenous knowledge and leaders. So I wanted to dig even further into how Lush got involved with their Indigenous partners in the first place. I think a lot of it came to when we were connecting around, like, what are the issues that we're talking about out in the world? And I remember very specifically for me, it was in 2010, and it was going to be our first kind of like um, public conversation about what was happening with with resource extraction in northern Alberta. And so we'd already done a lot of like environmentally based campaigns and work. And certainly this was a topic at the time that a lot of Canadians were not familiar with. And most people knew them or will now know them as the Alberta tar sands. But at that point in time, it wasn't really branded in that way. And so we were looking at like, okay, what does Lush as a business, like how do we get engaged in this and how do we have conversations around it? Because there was partners reaching out to say, well, you have stores in Alberta, you have stores in British Columbia, like this should be of interest to you and your customers. And so there was a lot of dialogue that we had between our staff and our customers around what we should champion. And quite honestly, it was it was a scary proposition initially when we took it to our president of the North American business, Mark Wolverton, and he was like, it sounds like it's the right thing to do even though it's going to be hard. So we need to figure out how we do this in a way, because of course, not everyone's going to be happy with the conversation, but how do we know that what we're doing is rooted in rights and justice and what we believe in? And so when we were looking around at organizations to connect with and looking at who are the most impacted people, I was like, well, we don't have any Indigenous organizations in Northern Alberta that we're working with. So we can partner with all of these other ally organizations, which are mostly white-led environmental organizations, and we can do all this stuff and who are the right politicians saying the right thing, but how do we actually build relationships and connect with communities? And so I was like, well, I need to reach out and explain and, and talk and see if there is a partner there because we can't assume that everyone was interested in in that relationship and partnership. And so I had a couple really close Indigenous friends at the time and they kind of pointed me in the direction of some folks to start having conversations with and picking up the phone was terrifying. I was like, what if they don't want to listen? What if they are like, why are you reaching out? Why do you care now? Like all these things were going through my head. And it's like, you're, this is when we didn't have cell phones. I'm still picking up a desk phone and giving them a, a call. And so then, you know, making these phone calls. And it was just amazing how well it was received. Like the fact that a company was taking this initiative to reach out and had done you know, research already around what are the harms and what are the impacts and who have we already spoken to? And we're genuinely coming to the table saying, we want to uplift your narrative and share what's going on in your community in the way that you want to say it. Interesting how there was pressure from customers and employees to act ethically. That was back in 2010. And if anything, this expectation has only increased. With the ability to call out companies online and the pervasiveness of cancel culture, which we talked about in season one, it makes sense why companies can be apprehensive to do things in a new way. However, as we keep hearing, Lush leaned into the discomfort. It had to have taken a lot of bravery to pick up the phone, to engage with employees and customers with high expectations, to take a stance on an issue. But they had the right intentions right from the start. What the former CEO of Lush said still rings true today. It's going to be hard, but you should do the right thing. By the time Lush approached the organizations they wanted to partner with, they had done their research. Their willingness to step aside and empower the affected communities was welcomed. That was the beginning of their journey into trust-based philanthropy and partnerships, and since then, they have seen their impact broaden. 
And so from there, we went from funding, I think at that time, 5% of our grants to indigenous led organizations to where LASH is at today in North America, which is close to 30% of all of their annual funding goes to indigenous led organizations. And that was also a transition from us is supporting organizations that support indigenous people to supporting indigenous led organizations. And then the next transition above that is how do you support indigenous led funds? So that it's indigenous people giving to indigenous people and having the sort of humility and letting go of the ego to allow for that to happen. So that's kind of, I hope, the trajectory that we see um, happen for, for Lush and their program, but also for other funders who are on the journey or starting to get on the journey is thinking about that end goal. To this day, Lush continues work to engage indigenous communities from the inside out, considering everything from accessibility to how they can further diversify their philanthropy. That was always our model around the campaigning piece was really what do the partners want to say and then how does Lush kind of amplify that? And that became part of the, I guess, the personal journey for myself and how do I build more relationships with Indigenous communities, organizations and leaders and really sparked, well, now let's take a look at all of the issues that we're funding and where is there the gap where we're not funding an Indigenous organization to do the work or another BIPOC organization, but we're funding ally organizations or organizations that are mostly um, staffed and run by, by white people, which isn't, again, that's not a, a bad thing. I'm not saying that you can't, but it's like, how do we have more diversity within philanthropy? And at that point in time, there wasn't a lot. 15 years ago, it doesn't look like it does now. And I'm not saying there's still not a lot of work to do. And so that kind of sparked the journey around, let's look at our giving and how is our program maybe not accessible? Are there things we're asking in the application form that are culturally inappropriate? How do we have Indigenous communities learn about our program? And so from there, the team was really tasked from a geographical perspective and an issue perspective to kind of do a deep dive and really look at that. Creating this kind of trajectory for change can certainly be grassroots within a company, but we must also acknowledge the need for top-down support. Lush forged a path into trust-based philanthropy with Indigenous partners for others to follow. It took courage and a commitment to do the right thing in the face of the unknown. 90% of the work we did was with communities externally, and then that other work was bringing that back in and educating staff and engaging staff and customers. And as soon as managers and people leaders started seeing how connected staff were to these issues and communities and their desire to want to support and be involved, then that becomes a development opportunity. It becomes a, a career path for someone, and it becomes a reason for folks to stay engaged with your business. So it became this value add along the way as you know we were able to further build out our employee program so it just kind of was this natural progression but yeah definitely at times when you are running a big business things like giving away dollars and doing things that are external to the company can feel like not the most important thing but i think what we learned over time is not doing that can harm your business and your um, employee retention and attracting new talent more than it ever did for the effort that you spent in putting those resources externally. We have people like Trisha and companies like Lush to thank for creating a roadmap that can give us all more confidence to do something similarly impactful in the world, but also in our own companies. Lush has been trailblazing for years, working to be a regenerative company and break new ground through their operations and social impact programs. They have taken concrete actions to reduce their ecological footprint and give back to the land, people, and communities that they touch. They are also working with Indigenous communities and farms to regenerate degraded land. The outcome is that the land is left in a richer, more diverse, and resilient state as a result of agriculture rather than in spite of it. However, most of the companies we interact with today are extractive, 
gas, timber, minerals, farming. And we're all participants in that system of resource extraction as consumers. But many companies and people are trying to do better. How? We educate ourselves, we shop differently, we strive to make a positive impact, like Trisha and like Lush. But here's the tricky part. As a business, you still need to carry out your operations and create the products people have come to love or need, all while causing less or no harm and creating a positive impact. Here's where Trisha says there are opportunities. There's lots of conversations around what does just transition look like? Like, how do we transform from an energy intensive economy and an extractive economy? And there's lots of really good people doing lots of good thinking around that. It needs to be a transition that is going to serve people, the environment, society as a whole. And that, again, just doesn't happen overnight. So it's up to individual businesses to take a look at what opportunities are there to do something different than what you're doing today. And I think with the advancements of, of technology and everything that's happening in these spaces, that there is a real opportunity to transition to, um, to an economy that actually is non-extractive, but it's going to take a lot of power and influence and time and patience to get there. And looking at, well, it's not just going to be a trade-off. Like we can't just full on go to a green technology economy unless we understand the impacts of that that's going to have on the environment. An example is like all of the mining that's going to be required for electric vehicle batteries and all of that. All of those resources are on indigenous lands. So we're already seeing conflict today around that. So when everyone's saying we need to go 100% this and 100% that, it's like by whatever the date is, 2030, 2040, no one's actually saying, but this is going to actually infringe on Indigenous rights to do that. So it's this really interesting journey of like, how do we get there together? But we know that there's going to be trade-offs because there's just a phenomenal amount of people on the planet and a lot of people who've grown to need a phenomenal amount of things to feel successful or feel whole. So there's also a process of like giving up for the people who have to then make way for those that need to be elevated. Trisha makes a really great point. Much of the positive change the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission or European regulators are pushing for may actually infringe on Indigenous land and Indigenous rights. While many Indigenous and environmental groups are already taking action to explain why and how Indigenous people must be a part of any climate risk disclosures to investors, companies need to be equally mindful of the unintended consequences of setting their environmental targets. This is one more reason why we need to be raising awareness of Indigenous rights and land ownership at a time when we are trying to get to net zero. With this knowledge, we will be able to do things differently than we have in the past because we have more experience now than we did when we began. To me, the most striking question Trisha asked was, how do we get there together? Here's what she had to say about building relationships with Indigenous communities and how the work starts within. Yeah, I think that's a really great question, Sona, and one that I don't think that there's any one right answer to. And I'll kind of talk about it from my perspective because I don't want to pretend that exactly what I've gone through is, is the right steps for everyone. But I really do believe that this journey is as much personal as it is a programmatic and a, and a company level one. You know, for me, um, being seventh generation Canadian, I'm a settler on this land. And so it really started with understanding my shared history with Indigenous people and the impacts that white supremacy and colonization has had on those communities. And not just from a historical perspective, but also how these harms still show up today. And, you know, this can be a very painful process as it often exposes how the how you have benefited from these harms and how they continue to be perpetuated and the potential privilege that this has afforded you. You know, and as individuals, we really need to do this work so that we can show up in, in a deep, meaningful way. I really encourage people having a look at your own philanthropic programs and how your business activities may still perpetuate harms and, and systems of injustice and really make time for deep conversations around this. Like it doesn't mean that you and your team and your company are trying to solve all the world's problems, but you're beginning to name the things that you would like to see changed. 
And, you know, once you've begun that work uh, at an individual level, a programmatic level, a company level, I really encourage people looking to Indigenous leadership on recommendations and steps that you can take to further your commitment. So we're not placing that burden of learning on the folks that are already deeply impacted by actions of colonization and white supremacy. And a couple places that I would, would call out for folks, if you're interested in doing deeper work, um, for those of you sort of in the US, I'd really like to recommend Edgar Villanueva's Decolonizing Wealth Project that is specifically designed for shifting philanthropy and specifically corporate and brand based philanthropy. And in Canada, I would say the learning space is created by the circle on philanthropy and Aboriginal people in Canada can be really helpful and useful in your organization, um, or even as an individual figuring out what the next steps are. There is so much power in individual action when we consider the big shifts we want to see on a larger scale. It will take all of us. Here are a few suggestions from Trisha on what you can do. I would suggest creating reading lists by Indigenous authors, trying to purchase those books from Indigenous-led bookstores. So again, thinking about what are all of the small things that you can do that really do add up to a lot for you as an individual and for your organization. And then certainly folks in, in Canada, especially from a, an individual as well as a business perspective, is really understanding the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the report that came out and specifically the calls to action for business and looking at those three calls to actions and making decisions on how potentially you as a business might move forward, set some goals around that. And again, it's a continuum and it's a learning journey and you're going to make mistakes along the way. It's going to feel difficult and hard, but in the end, you're gonna look around and be very proud of the relationships that you have made and that, you know, and the progression that we're all moving forward together. So it's like, how do we as indigenous and non-indigenous people build a future that we both are going to be look back on and be proud of that shared history and really there's so many opportunities for that to happen and and you as an individual in your organization or someone running a philanthropic program have a lot of power right now and responsibility to ensure that you're educating people within your organization and, and showing that path forward building a future that indigenous and non-indigenous people can be proud of that sounds a lot like reconciliation to me. It reminds me of the seventh generation principle too. It's an indigenous concept that means the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. It's a call to the people of today to work for the benefit of the generations to follow. We're all in this together and we have a lot more power than we think. So let's make a change. Now you might be asking yourself, how will I know if I'm making a difference? What does success really look like? It really is like, what's the paradigm shift that's required around how we define success? And certainly traditionally, we have all of our impacts and measures around people served or how many meals or how many dollars and all these kinds of things. And it's not to say that that is not bad or that it's incorrect, but it tends to be the only thing that people look at is these investment versus impact models and things that are really bite-sized for boards or for, you know, the C and D suites of organizations, but really on the ground, how does that materialize and what does that look like? I think we really need to reevaluate success and start thinking about things as like, how do we value relationships and how do we value health and well-being and how do we value inclusion in philanthropy? Like, how are we providing seats at the table and making space and all of these other things that I guess are a bit more intangible. So how do we move away from some of these things that seem very tangible and seem like you're getting lots of results, but ultimately that may not be the, the impact that's needed on the ground. And how do we kind of get more out of that numbers driven space to something that's really rooted in um, human nature and how do we co-design so that we're creating thriving futures not just only for indigenous communities but for for all human beings and i think to me success is a more holistic vision versus just numbers but that being said i would say for anybody that wants to have some numbers we'll just 
go back to sort of what was called out earlier around, you know, less than 4% of all global funding goes to Indigenous people and causes. And in the U.S., that's numbers is around 1.2. So we know that you, we can be setting targets just even like tomorrow around looking at how much we're giving and how do we increase that. But that alone is not enough if we're not building deep, meaningful relationships. What resonates with me is the idea of redefining success and reprioritizing relationships. It's not just what we are doing to drive impact, it's how we impact the community based on how we operate. We need to look at who we want to be as people, partners, and companies engaging with Indigenous peoples. And much of this work starts at the individual level, with a personal journey. I hear people call it doing the work, but to me it doesn't feel tedious or difficult. In fact, it's engrossing and enriching. It's work worth doing. And there are a lot of people who can be our inspiration. Just look to our guests this season. You need a humble heart, like Melissa said. The courage to speak truth to power like Ruka did. Channel your inner warrior like Lourdes. Stand up for what you know to be right and just. And step into discomfort, just as Trisha did. What we're trying to do is long-term change work. And yes, it could take generations to change our current reality, but everything we learn and everything we do today will set the course of our future. And if we don't start now, change may take even longer or may not happen at all. Special thanks to Trisha Stevens for sharing her insights and experiences and for getting me and Benevity started on our reconciliation journey. To learn more about Trisha and other topics discussed today, look for our show notes or head to our website, benevity.com slash speaking of purpose. I like to think about season two of Speaking of Purpose as part of mine and Benevity's ongoing reconciliation journey. And I hope by sharing what I've learned, you'll feel like you've had a little help on your journey too. One thing I didn't mention during the series is one of the concepts a wise man named Tim Fox shared with me. Tim is the Vice President of Indigenous Relations and Equity Strategy with the Calgary Foundation. This concept is called knowledge mobilization. At its simplest, it means once you learn something, you should pass it along. So let's do that. Let's take a quick look back at what we learned and how we can turn it into action. First, we heard from Melissa Nelson, who unpacked how our tragic history continues to affect Indigenous peoples and the land we all live on today. As individuals, we have the responsibility to learn about the history of Indigenous peoples, their rights, their struggles, and their resiliency. It's the first step toward reconciliation. To put that knowledge into action, here are four ideas. One, learn about the land where you live, work, and play, and about the original people who stewarded the land, and find out how to acknowledge the land in a meaningful way. Two, read Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission report and the 94 Calls to Action. Three, set up a recurring donation to an Indigenous nation or organization in your community after you've learned about their impact. And four, Consider paying a voluntary tax, like the Shumi tax, with land acknowledgements, especially for company gatherings. In Episode 2, Ruka Sumbalingi revealed the present-day experiences of people in Indigenous communities across the Indonesian archipelago and the conflicts they have with organizations. We learned that building trust is key to creating and strengthening bonds between Indigenous communities and companies and it will take all of us to drive the change required for a better future. As a consumer, you have a lot of power. You can learn more about where your products come from and how the communities where the resources are extracted for those products are treated. Then, you can make more informed buying decisions by purchasing from companies whose values align with yours. It's a simple yet powerful way to hold companies accountable. Next, Lourdes Zinga revealed the blind spot in philanthropy, as in the discrepancy in funds going towards Indigenous peoples considering the proportion of the global population that they make up. She also brought us into the world of Indigenous-led philanthropy and how it is a shining hope for meaningful change. 
We also can't forget the many examples she shared of how women are the most fierce protectors of indigenous land, culture, and ways of knowing. Lourdes revealed how philanthropy inherently contains harmful power dynamics with the communities we are trying to serve. By creating horizontal relationships and supporting organizations where indigenous peoples are able to practice self-determination, we can rebalance power and make our giving more impactful. That means we must start by changing the way we give. Next time you want to support an indigenous cause, consider who is deciding how the funds will be used or how you can make it easier for indigenous causes to apply for grants if you're working in that space. We also need to shift our expectations around giving and acknowledge that long-term meaningful change will take sustained action and support. Lastly, we heard from Tricia Stevens. We learned that it takes courage to step into uncomfortable places, but with the right intent and humility, companies can build trust between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Lush provided us a roadmap and showcased how top-down support, grassroots change, and the willingness to take risks are all essential to driving the change we want to see. To get there, we have to do the work at the personal, program, and company levels. Starting with the personal, try reading books by Indigenous authors. Or if you work in social impact, reach out to organizations that partner with Indigenous communities and learn how your company can do something similar. That brings us here. The season was short, but rich. We hope you think so too. Thanks for journeying with us. Don't forget to review our show notes for resources to support further learning on your reconciliation journey. Speaking of Purpose was created by the passionate team here at Benevity, a technology and engagement platform that helps the world's most iconic brands bring their purpose to life, headquartered in Calgary, Canada. We hope it provides you with a spark of inspiration to find your purpose and your way of leaving the world better than you found it. This podcast was recorded on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Sutina and Stony Nakoda First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Benevity's headquarters is situated on land across from the Bow River, which has shaped this land and its people for generations. To listen to past episodes and get new episodes as soon as they're released, subscribe or follow Speaking of Purpose wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with a coworker or a friend. Thanks for listening.